Welcome everyone. It's Angelo Robles to the Angelo Robles podcast. I'm also the founder and CEO at Family Office Association. I am really intrigued today to do something. I actually have interviewed this fine gentleman once or twice at our physical events, but I don't think you ever would have thought that I would have hosted a podcast and I'm enthused to. Looking at colored diamonds as a store of value and possibly a long-term investment. Our special guest is Alan Bronstein, president of Aurora Gems, and he's joining us all the way from the beautiful state of Hawaii. Alan, how are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's great to be with you. Well, thank you. And I want to give a little bit of context before we jump right into it. So many of you, of course, are familiar with traditional asset classes, stocks, bonds, real estate, gold, lately, Bitcoin and crypto assets. And I don't know if I would necessarily look at it purely, and Alan would probably agree from an investing perspective, but for a passion, a love, a store of value, if it's of a certain quality and long-term, maybe investment. The opportunity of something like colored diamonds, which by the way, are kind of off the grid, unlike practically every other asset. And I don't know if I could hold more net worth in one hand than I could get with the highest level of colored diamonds. So they're very discreet for people. Why don't I leave it at that? You could read between any lines that you want. But I'm really excited to have Alan on. Back in the days of New York, it was great to go visit Alan and hear him talk and his passion about his collection and color diamonds and his business. And great to talk to him now, even though it's many thousands of miles away. This will be a little different and we hope you enjoy it. Alan, why don't we start with you know, what are, although I think it's pretty obvious, but there's different types of color diamonds, why they are not all equal, and then we'll segue into supply demand and why that's so important. Okay, thank you very much. I would like first to say that uh, we're discussing specifically natural color diamonds, as opposed to man-made color diamonds, which are something that exists today in the world and challenges the concept of natural color diamonds. It's very important to differentiate. So natural color diamonds essentially are coming from the ground. And as we see them, that they have not been altered or changed by man. So that's why we refer to them as natural fancy color diamonds. And essentially, uh, they can come from anywhere that diamonds are mined in the world. Some mines have more interesting uh, colors that uh, come out of the ground and other mines are known for their colors. And the way that the fancy color diamond has evolved is that it's always been something of interest, curiosity, and having intrinsic value. When we go back in history of all diamonds, there was some intrinsic value in diamonds. They were able to use them to trade, to barter, and also to save their lives if they needed to. And if we go forward to today, then we have the new 40 years ago, uh, fancy colored diamonds became more popular and known. Why did this take place in 1980? In 1980, there was a new investment craze for diamonds, all diamonds. And fancy colored diamonds just became more popular or people were aware of them at that time. They knew, the people who were discovering this, that fancy colored diamonds were much rarer than, what, than colorless diamonds. So they became something that investment people thought would be a good way to direct uh, clients to go into that. And I'll give you an example. In 1980, which I was already in the fancy colored diamond business, so to speak, it was just really getting off the ground. And I was shown a 20 carat blue diamond, which was offered to me for $100,000 a carat. That's, it was a, it was a fantastic blue diamond, $2 million. Today, that diamond, if it was back in the market, would be a diamond for $60 million. So we can see 
from that perspective that that diamond was a great investment for the person who bought it. But that is true for only a few specific diamonds that have that potential to appreciate like that. So we see that there is still um, interest and momentum in the trade with fancy colored diamonds. Um, they come in all different colors, yellow, pink, and blue, and every color you can imagine. Um, it's a very long process to try to um, give you that uh, intricate um, valuation or desirability for those stones, but just knowing that you can get a diamond in any color that you can imagine should spark some interest, so to speak, as an object of curiosity, an object of desire, and possibly an object of passion. So I think that any color diamond can fulfill that for a person, but I don't want to, I'm not going to push the uh, concept that all color diamonds are an investment because they are not, they're not a potential investment, but some are, and we will go into that. Yeah, that's a great foundation. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about what you said. The way that I heard you say synthetic diamonds man-made implied that they could look very much like, quote unquote, the real thing, fancy color diamonds coming from the ground. Is that implying that people that are not properly educated and have the right experts around them, one, may be fooled, and two, people that they think are experts, some of them may be frauds. And in it strictly for the money and pulling the wool over someone's eyes. I don't think that is the case um, using man-made created, man-created diamonds against natural uh, fancy colored diamonds from the earth. I don't think that people try to deceive people by using them uh, to say that they're natural color. However, they are potentially identical to the way natural colored diamonds work, uh, look, excuse me. And therefore, uh, people can look at them as an alternative if it's not, if it's not uh, important for somebody to have a natural stone, which is the one that has intrinsic value and also is a potential investment, then I say that a, a, a man-made stone could satisfy somebody very easily. But that takes the whole investment strategy or potential out of it because man-made stones, which one can create an infinite number of, which is gonna become right. like anything else, a commodity that it's gonna go down in value and it does not necessarily have um, any buyers that can will- you tell, Can you tell them. quickly just by looking or it takes a pretty deep analysis to be sure? Well, I'll tell you that if you have enough expertise, which I think that I do, then you can visually look at stones and say, this looks too good, or it doesn't look right, or I haven't seen this particular shade of diamond before. And you can say, I question whether it's real or not. But the truth is, is that the only way to differentiate it is through a laboratory analysis. We need to have some kind of paper from a laboratory to give us the confidence in order to buy it as a natural color diamond. What is likely the most rare color of a color diamond? Is it blue? Um, blue is not the rarest color, but it seems to be the most valuable color because it's the most in demand color. So while it's extremely rare, because it's historically been the most desirable color by the public, uh, uh, I think that it creates the, the greatest demand and therefore the supply, which is not as great as the demand, keeps the valuations of diamonds very strong. But I would say the rarest color, there's a few rarest colors. And when you talk about a color, there's a wide range of colors within that color specification. So if you say a red diamond, for example, a red diamond is probably the rarest color if it's a truly red object, okay? But in gem, uh, uh, gem nomenclature, there are diamonds which may not appear red as objects that do get graded as a red object. So this is where your expertise of knowing how to differentiate a stone that just has a, 
a, a paper name and a diamond that looks like it actually does, which should be common sense for most people. You know what I mean? Like use your senses, look at what you're looking at. Does it look like the color that it's uh, described as on paper? That's a very significant and important uh, judgment call there. Red, purple, orange, the best. We're talking about the best. If you, you take an orange diamond or a red diamond or a purple diamond, there's a range of colors in that description. So you have to know how to look at the stone. You can't just read the paper in order to decide it's, it's a rare diamond or not. And you did say that not all color diamonds, even of a similar you, quote unquote, are created equal. Some may be mediocre, some may be decent. Those will probably not be great. They may be partially an investment or a store of value, but that there's certain ones that rise to the top. Does that have anything to do if you want to describe what's known as the four C's? What makes a diamond special, like that top three to 5% in a specific color? Well, it's a combination of many of the qualities that a diamond has, but the most important aspect of any natural color diamond is its color. And what does that mean? So if you take the color blue, for example, which is, is the most valuable per carat stone. So when, when I say that, I just gave an example of a blue diamond that's sold or was offered in 1980 for $100,000 a carat. Uh, a blue diamond was sold six years ago at auction for $4 million a carat, which was half the size. And that diamond sold for $48 million. That was an extraordinarily magnificent, rare color blue diamond. There are diamonds that are have the same name as that particular diamond that are graded the same way. And if you saw that, you would assume that they look identical. But there are blue diamonds out there that at the same moment in time were selling for $2 million a carat. So if you think about the spread, then for, therefore you're seeing a 100% spread between what might be the lowest a grade or visualization of that particular diamond based on its certificate and the highest grade, the, high, the, the best stone in that particular grade, what it's capable of appreciating. Now, how does a, uh, a person who does not have uh, experience tell the difference? If you have not been able to compare stones for a long period of time, or you haven't seen many stones, hundreds of stones, whatever, in order to have a mental image of what the best stone might look like, then you're gonna assume whatever you're looking at is the best that there is. And that's the, that's the mistake that many people fall into because they're just given the information or told by salespeople, this is the best when it necessarily is not. So having a second opinion or a an eye or a guide or an expert who can put it in perspective is extremely helpful in making a, a financial decision like this. Oh, in something like color diamonds, that is absolutely needed. How to identify an expert, we'll get to some of that in the work that you do shortly. Uh, a couple of things, and some of the research that I did, and it was very vague in terms of long term, 100 years out, the uh, investment return on color diamonds. It kind of came to, from my research, about 7%. And I thought to myself, and what you're saying now, that could be incredibly misleading, meaning there may be many that have stayed the same value or might have even lost a little bit of value. There's others that may have appreciated 1% or 2%. And probably what, what makes that number, which is just a median, it really, it's the top probably one to 3% of diamonds, however that's identified, that has maintained its store of value and over time has grown. So looking at averages where I'm going to invest in color diamonds and over 10 years, I'm going to average 7%, incredibly misleading. That is the problem and probably keeps natural colored diamonds from being even more desirable and more effective because when you get 
mixed messages about anything. When you have people telling you the wrong thing, it poisons the well. It doesn't give people the, the right information in order to make the right decisions. So we need, you know, more people need to not trust all of that propaganda that goes out there. You know, it's mostly in people who are invest in the investment business, not in the diamond business that are promoting these concepts and trying to sell uh, fancy color diamonds as an investment. I'll tell you this, you know who are the biggest investors in fancy color diamonds? Diamond dealers are because when they see a special stone, they want to grab it. And what their philosophy is, most of them is, is that they want to make a profit, but that'll be the last thing that they sell. They'll sell everything else before that to get liquidity because they know that has the most potential for appreciation, so to speak. So you can't really, I wouldn't suggest doing this on your own unless you know money was not an object and you, and you wanted to you know, just buy what you like. But um, many diamonds have, dime, fancy colored diamonds like all diamonds, they don't just appreciate, they don't just bubble and collapse. Their cycles, let's say in the last 40 years since I've been in business, I've seen six cycles. And what does that mean? That means that the diamonds would, uh, there'd be a price that started and then it would go up, up, up because there's more demand and there's more um, information going out and there's more publicity. The biggest publicity comes from the auction houses. That's the only place where we have information that we can actually say is legitimate because everything else is hearsay. So for example, if I said something to you, I saw a diamond or I sold a diamond for a million dollars a carat, well, how can you prove that's right? So there's no true information, but if you wanna look at the history in the last 40 years, that's the time where fancy color diamonds have become a focal point as a potential investment and a, a store of value, then I would say that um, 90, 90 percent of the diamonds have been uh, going through this cycle of ups and downs over the last uh, uh, 40 years where they went up and peaked at a certain price and as as financial things go like even supply and demand plays a role but the financial world plays a role in this when people have more money they're more willing to buy you know things like diamonds or you know extraordinary diamonds. But when people don't have money, they kind of pull back a little bit. That's not high on their priority list. So that's a cycle where the diamonds go down. And then when, when money is flush in the market, there seems to be a greater demand for these as some kind of uh, investment or store of value. Um, and the cycles always are in like an oval shape or have been historically. And what do I mean by that? So the diamonds, I'll use numbers as an example. If a diamond is $10,000 a carat and it goes down to $6,000 a carat uh, based on the demand is weak and the supply is greater than the demand. So that's how the prices will regulate. And um, it's gone through this process. It goes down to six. And then the next rise, it might go up to 12 or 15. And then it'll come down to seven in its next cycle down. So what I've seen in the cycles is that every cycle, when the diamonds go up, they reach a new high in terms of uh, uh, how much you have to pay in order to get something special. And then they'll come down, they soften, like everything softens, the stock market softens, pe people make adjustments. And then it will go up again, but it usually goes up higher than its previous high. So in all the cycles, if we talk about when in 1980, if a blue diamond of 20 carats, a spectacular blue diamond was $100,000 a carat. And by the way, that was a ceiling. That was a $100,000 was the ceiling that diamonds did not surpass, at least from public knowledge. And at least from me being in the market, today that cycle has gone up to four million dollars per carat and wow. it's when it and it's dropped down 
Now it's gone down a little bit because it's going through the cycle again. The peak was in 2014, and now it's beginning to go up again. And the same diamond might be $3 million a carat today, if you can find it. Why do I say if you can find it? Because what happened during the last year of COVID, unfortunately shut down world markets on everything. And it shut down mining on everything. And people have backed away from everything. So there was an artificial price drop. That means because there's no transactions taking place, people don't know how to move. So the people who have the most extraordinary diamonds, there's always bottom feeders. And I don't, call, I don't say that in a negative way, but there's always people who go out there and when they know that something might be uh, cheaper or they can get a bargain, you know, fish for people who will need liquidity and want to sell them. And what I've seen in the last year is that everybody, or maybe almost everybody, has decided to put their best fancy color diamonds in the safe because they don't want it to, they don't want to get terrible offers on it because this is a very subjective thing. I mean, it is, sure. there's, there's no exact price to a diamond, but people who have things that are spectacular don't want to give them away. So they've essentially held off putting them on the market, which basically squeezes the supply and makes them more rare because they're not available to buy until they're going to hit a certain price point, then they'll start moving again. So you can find a straggler here and there, but uh, the best stones are actually quietly not being shown in the market today. And rightfully so, because you don't want to burn them. Burnt means that you expose them to everybody and that everybody knows somebody asked the price and that's called being burnt. That means that why didn't somebody else buy it? Because you know that makes people fearful. So they don't want to approach the business like that. And so I'm encouraged knowing that the market, which I just said to you, the diamond dealers are the biggest investors in fancy color diamonds because they understand the rarity. Some of them understand the beauty. Some of them understand the potential of their diamond and some of them are actually dreaming that they might appreciate, they might receive a price which is unrealistic because the higher the price goes, the more you're gonna have somebody who's going to do a due diligence on that stone, who's going to make it apparent that it may not be the perfect stone. So- yeah, That's you know, great insight, Alan. I think it keeps on coming back to long-term, 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 and even then to be potentially a decent investment and a store of value, it really probably has to be, maybe I was too conservative at my one to 3%, you were probably closer to 10%, but that still is one in 10. That's not a lot. And without an expert to help you understand the market, perhaps get certain diversity within a variety of color diamonds that may cost a pretty good amount of money, depending on how much you may want to long-term allocate. But like art, unlike other forms of money from uh, currency or investments like stock, Bitcoin, this is something you could see, feel, and touch. It has that, let's go with the word intrinsic value, passion, uh, there's human interest in it. And that's what makes this, like art, somewhat subjective and interesting to people more than just a store of value. And it's a potentially long term, a good investment. I like to call it a passion investment. OK, I mean, if you want to refer to any when you buy uh, a painting or an artwork, you you are if you can afford the top things, then you're looking at it from not that it has the potential to appreciate, but I love that I want it in my house or wherever it is. I want to show it. I want to share it with my friends. You're passionate about the artist. You're passionate about the painting. This is what drives the value. When you talk about what you're passionate about, that is not something that um, uh, has a exact value. You can't say, oh, that's worth X or that's worth Y. It's actually worth what somebody's asking for it and what you're willing to pay for it. And that's why we find, that's why we find that prices or values are all over the place. Now, if I say to you that I know that outside of the auction house where uh, transactions take place that we can actually prove 
here's the price. Uh, everybody knows the value or the price of something. There are diamonds and probably the most diamonds sell from um, the owner, a dealer or a retail store, which is very prominent to a private person at higher prices than when we, what we experience at the auction. So the auction is, a, is a, a, a definitely a, a source of information, but there are diamonds that are more valuable than those stones at auction. And there's a lot of diamonds that don't meet the criteria that the auction houses bring. That's why it's important if you're not in this business that you have somebody who is in this business. I like the analogy I always gave about Henry Ford, okay? I mean, Henry Ford, I heard the story, I read it. You know, maybe he wasn't, he didn't know all the answers to something, but they, he always said, oh, I don't know the answer to that, but I have 10 people who do know the answer. They will tell me what I need to know. So does, does a person who wants to buy these things have to know everything about the stones? Well, it's good for you to do your due diligence. And I would say this is one of the most interesting things that you can explore uh, in, in gemology, the, the, the beauty and variety and history of these stones. But you don't need to know 20 years or 40 years of knowledge like I do or somebody else does in order to look at something beautiful and say that you love it and want to take the chance to buy that thing. Yes, you can go your own way, but if you don't want to overpay by too much, if it's something that's you know so subjective, like, like I said before, values can vary up to 100% depending on the stone and depending on the seller of the stone. They may not have as many, they may not know as much, so they have an artificial kind of assumption. They'll base the value of their diamond on what happened at the auctions recently. And they'll think that their stone is equivalent to that, which may not be the case. We don't want to fall into that kind of a trap when we're buying something. You mentioned over the 40 years of more tracking color diamonds, which coincides with you coming into the industry, there's been six cycles and we're kind of coming out what has been perhaps a five to six, six and a half year uh, let's call it a bear market in color diamonds where the prices have dropped. So yeah, if you're buying for the short term, which in this asset class, if I could call it that, you should never do. Uh, that would have been a bad time to look to sell, but it's starting to come up. My question out of that is probably more of a store of value question. In times of turmoil, let's go with war, similar to gold or maybe other unique pieces like art have diamonds going up during periods of turmoil, specifically higher level color diamonds, which if we only have 40 years of history, we don't have enough background to really understand that. It's true. So we can't make that kind of uh, analogy to color diamonds because the history of color diamonds is so short term. And what do I mean by that? Well, they existed from the beginning of all diamonds, but they only started to take hold in the consciousness in 1980 when, you know, the colorless diamonds were being promoted as an investment and that crashed by the way, but fancy color diamonds did not crash by the way, they did drop because everything dropped, but they maintained the floor, which was higher than white colorless diamonds. So, you know, we saw that as the beginning of that might be something that people can you know, start to show more interest in. Now, um, the, the auction houses have played the biggest role in this because they are the most visible promoters of fancy color diamonds. And uh, they're the ones we go to to try to gauge the values that, that a diamond might be based on the nomenclature that describes the stone. But we need to um, look at diamonds, color diamonds. They do have intrinsic value. If I go over the last 40 years of me being in the business, there was never a time where you couldn't get some liquidity on the best stones, the nicest stones, the rarest stones. There is always somebody in the trade who will take a chance on a curiosity like that. But um, it doesn't necessarily filter into the private sector, I would say because the, the, when we go to those lows, diamonds are the last things that people are focused on, so to speak. 
Let's talk a little bit about the auction houses from a little different perspective. If I have a very high quality, fancy color diamond and I go to an auction house to sell it, it's convenient. It may have interesting bidders and maybe that does bring some intriguing prices, but the auction houses are not charities. They're getting paid and they're getting paid a lot that's going to potentially eat into the profits. Correct. Well, the, you know, the auction houses do a great job and they're entitled to make a profit on that too. But essentially they take about 25%. That's a lot. <laughs> that's right. A lot. And, that's, and that's why you don't see everything flooding into the auction houses because many diamond dealers, ha you know, have an illusion. They don't want to give away that 25% if they own something special. And the auction houses, if you want to look at it, uh, drastic, if they sell one or two or five very important diamonds during the course of a year or an auction period, that is not necessarily indicative of the hundreds of other stones that exist out in the market that might exist. So they're setting you a price point range, but they're not necessarily setting the price on all the diamonds there. You can draw certain conclusions from that, but you can't base all your decisions on that because it can be an artificially high price. What happens at an auction, you have two people that want to have something. I'll give you the perfect example. Um, there was a, in 1987, I think it was 87 or 86. So Christie's had a diamond for sale. It was one of the first ones they've ever shown with a certificate said purplish red. It was an old Brazilian diamond. It was really beat up, very imperfect, small, less than one carat in size. And it was something that was, it wasn't a, it wasn't a hundred percent looked at as like, this is a, the best, a rarest object. And yet there were two clients that wanted to buy that diamond. It was in the, it was, it was uh, valued at the time for $100,000 maybe in the catalog, which was extremely high for the imperfect size of the diamond. But the diamond ended up selling for almost a million dollars a carat because there were two customers who wanted to have that diamond. They had never seen a color like that. They just said, whatever you know, money it is. So they essentially were willing to pay any price to get that stuff. By the way, that diamond was bought on behalf of the Sultan of Brunei. I'm sorry, my my connection just came out. Nope. It's looking and sounding pretty good, Alan. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, and when this, uh, so when this diamond sold, that really set off the, call it the gold rush for colored diamonds. Like people said, right. if a one carat diamond, which is so broken up, but has an extraordinary color, can get a million dollars a carat, because it was super rare, then everybody at that point jumped into the, into the uh, market and wanted, said, oh, every fancy color diamond must be desirable or must be valuable, which is not the case. That was a one-off extra. But you see two people who want something can bid something up to a price that's unrealistic in the trade at that moment. By the way, what happened after that? Everybody raised their prices on fancy color diamonds across the board. <laughs> what a surprise. Here's, here's an indication. But you know what? It didn't work because there was resistance. And people just said, I don't see the value. I'm not interested. And we're talking about diamond dealers because if it doesn't get past diamond dealers, then it's not going to make its way out into the, into the marketplace where private customers are interested to you know, go forward to. It's not going to have the right panache to do that. So we have these cycles, like we said, and the cycles are trending higher. Now, let me give you another example. We just had a couple of auctions during COVID and the auctions were online. People didn't get to see them, but we were still trending down before COVID. And we still, we had, it was a mix. There were mixed results. What does that mean? very specific stones or colors were highly uh, chased after. Don't ask me why. There's plenty of stones out there like that. But the results were many beautiful things did not sell. 
surprisingly, even though they were you know, low reserves. And many things that were extraordinary got 1 million a carat, 1.5 million a carat. Maybe they were 25, 30% below their previous highs two, three years ago for those particular stones. What that proves to me is that the demand for natural diamonds is still very strong. The fact that that's where these stones are settling during the worst possible time. Another thing that is giving strength to the market of fancy color diamonds is that mining companies where these diamonds come from are now getting into the manufacture of those diamonds instead of selling the rough stone. They see that if they sell the rough diamond, the diamond has the potential of being worth double or triple or quadruple after they cut the stone. So they wanna squeeze more value out of it. They take different positions. They'll cut the stones themselves or they will sell the rough and maintain a financial position on it. So if it's a higher upside, they get a percentage of the upside. So just the fact that diamond mining companies are now looking at that as a, a, a profit uh, area is reassuring to me because they have the diamonds, they get the diamonds and they want to protect the values of those diamonds. And they see them because they're super rare, some of them as appreciating in the future going forward. And mind you, a dollar is not, today a dollar is not the same as it was 40 years ago. And the same thing 40 years from now, a dollar is gonna be worth a different, maybe a penny. I don't even know what a dollar will be worth, but the diamonds should hold the current value uh, in that moment rather than the old value at that moment, which they should stay ahead of the devaluation of money and the appreciation uh, of, uh, you know, the, uh, what, what's that called again? The, the cost of money every, it goes up like, you know. Uh, um, Basically our dollar's worth less every year. Inflation, right, whatever, <laughs> inflation, inflation, right. Inflation takes away the value of Our purchasing power is a better way to put it. And that really is the store correct. of value over time in the right color of diamonds. Uh, yes. Alan, in the world of art, you could want to own your art, not sell it and be subject to capital gains, but feel maybe arbitrage relative through an interest rate, or maybe you just need liquidity. Is there a lending market where I still want to own it, but maybe we'll put it in a third party vault, but it's still mine, but it's used as collateral for 50% of its loan to value or whatever, 30%. Is there anything like that in color diamonds? I wouldn't, I don't know of that personally. I wouldn't be surprised if it exists, but I think that most uh, loaners or bankers or whoever might want to loan against diamonds, I don't see that they find it as a secure loan. So I don't think that many diamonds are used as, you know, collateral in that sure. capacity because uh, it's a, it's too fluid of a, you know, changing market and changing world and the banks, they, they always get caught holding the bag, let's put it that way. So, you know, diamonds for banks are a dangerous kind of, uh, of commodity to hold on to and to loan money again. The, the only people who use that as collateral are the people in the diamond industry. That's what they have. So, you know, they buy their diamonds and, the, and then they want to borrow more money and they'll, they'll uh, you know, uh, appraise them or put them in as a valuation to borrow more money from the banks. But I don't see that as necessarily a um, end user's... Uh, right, no, I would say not. Well, well, let's put it this way. If somebody is able to buy something like that, they're not going to need to collateralize that, okay? That, I think they're buying that more because they, are, um, they want to enjoy it. They right. get a lot of pleasure because from they it. they can. They want to show it to their friends. Look what right. I got. You know what I mean? And it is a, a unique thing if you have beautiful stones to show people. Like most of the time they go, what is that? Like that is so <laughs> wild. And it's good to have that kind of uh, barter, uh, uh, banter with people, you know, about showing them something new or unusual that they haven't. Experienced. That's the joy of owning something unique. I don't think it's any different than art. To me, you know, a color diamond, Natural color diamonds is a, 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 little piece, a little piece of 
nature's art, which you know man has tried to enhance and make a little bit more desirable. Rough diamonds are not usually collectibles, but you know manufactured cut diamonds are. And they, they have a certain kind of beauty that can pull you in the right stone. Everybody has a different taste. So if you ask about colors, nobody should focus on a color because it, it's a high value or because it might have a better intrinsic value or because it might be a better investment value. They, shouldn't, they should focus on it because I think this is so fantastic. I am proud to own this. It makes me happy to have this. And I want to show it to my friends because I want them to share in the experience of this. That's pretty much the value, the, in, the passion investment that you get out of exquisite natural color diamonds. Well, and Alan, as we're heading a little bit to the home stretch, maybe tell us a little bit of a, a short story, maybe a buyer beware, maybe something really interesting. You, you've seen so much in your 40 years, I'd love to listen. Uh, you know, I really don't know where to begin because in 40 <laughs> years, I think you have, you know, hundreds or thousands of experiences. Um, but I am a collector myself. So as being a collector, you know, I would always go out there, you know, hunting for the unusual, like looking for a unicorn, you know, or looking for a, an unidentified flying object or something that nobody's ever seen before besides something being extraordinarily beautiful and rare. And I think that journey myself, which has made me kind of like more, not just more passionate, but more compassionate for all the colors, not just the most valuable or expensive or desired stones, because there's such a universe of beautiful stones out there. And essentially what investors have tried to do is they've tried to say, just buy this or just buy that, which is not giving people the opportunity to make their own decisions or have their own taste. So, you know, my finding certain stones, which were, you know, like, you know, off the charts in terms of their, their color I had never seen before or whatever. I'll give you one example of that. Okay, so here's an anecdotal story. I'd never, I had gone to Antwerp on a buying trip and I went to an office that I was very familiar with and they said, do you want to see something interesting that you might never have seen before? And I said, are you kidding? That's what I look for. <laughs> so, so the woman brought out a stone, just a 50 point stone, a little stone, and she showed me the stone and it was purple. And I said, oh my God, I've never seen that color before in diamonds. And I asked to buy it. And she said, it's not for sale right now because we've never seen this before and we don't know how to price it. Because see, that's what diamond dealers do. They want to try to figure out what something's worth if it's rare. And the, to make a long story short, I just started to see a trickle of diamonds like this come out. They came unknowingly, but we discovered they came from Russia. And Russia is a, the primary source for diamonds of this color. And what happened was at this moment in time, Russia had stopped uh, giving their diamonds to De Beers, which was the major distributor in the world at the time. And De Beers would always you know, filter them out, not necessarily as valuable stones or rarities, but just you know, filter them out into the market. So people didn't know what they were getting. Mm -hmm. And when we discovered this particular genre of color, it was so exciting because we were able to say, here's a new color uh, that diamonds exist in naturally that you don't see very often. And purple is not a very beautiful color, by the way. I mean, it's not everybody's favorite, but in nature, it's super rare. So that gives it a little bit more desirability for a collectible. And that was something for me that was very like exciting being in the midst of kind of discovering something that hadn't been talked about before in the context of originating in Russia and purple diamonds existing. They're mostly small and very imperfect stones. So they don't fit necessarily the, the criteria that people say as an investment stone, but as something rare, as collectible and potentially really beautiful to some people. I think that that was a, a moment for me because I got 
over the moon when I discovered this myself for my particular uh, uh, mission about collecting the vast majority of colors and diamonds. No, that's, that's great. Important. And Alan, for those that are like, this is really interesting, but like you said, I mean, <laughs> this is not a do-it-yourself project. Uh, in terms of your background in helping families of wealth and the like potentially evaluate, source evaluate and make a decision on purchase, talk a little bit, and we probably have a couple of minutes left about your practice and how you could help people. Well, I, I have evolved from a diamond broker to a diamond dealer. A diamond dealer is somebody who buys the diamonds and then looks for customers to sell them. And as time went on and the diamonds started to appreciate in value so much, let's say to a million or $2 million a carat, it became prohibitive to be a buyer of stones and to inventory them and then to look for a customer of stones. So I've pretty much evolved into strictly a consultant. I have all the information in my mind. I don't have to have the stones in my hand, so to speak. And you, for those that don't know, Alan wrote two amazing books, like one of the most beautiful, but you know, it's hardcover bounded and beautiful pictures of diamonds and his collection. So he's been in the business a long time, but pardon me, Alan, please continue. So essentially I strictly act as an objective observer consultant. Like if I have a private client, then I represent them. I don't represent the stone. I'm trying to do the due diligence on their behalf. And certainly they could do this themselves. If you know where to look and if you know where stones are hidden, then you could pass it. It might take you a long time, but I'm not saying that, a per but then you have to know exactly what you're looking at. Is this a good stone? Is this a special stone? Is this one of a kind, or is this one of the mundane examples of the same um, color family of the stones? So essentially I sell my knowledge and I support the buyers of these kind of stones in order to help them make the right decision if there's between two stones, or I can tell them this is not a good stone for you. I don't recommend this stone. Or I could also say in uh, the reverse, this stone, even though it's priced at a higher value of stones we know have sold at auction or whatever it is, buy this diamond. It's so unique. You're not going to see another one like this either at all or for a very long time. So essentially, I'm just giving my expertise based on my time and based on what I've seen in my life to help people to, you know, make their make a right decision for themselves. But ultimately. I do not make any decisions on behalf of any client. I want them to say, I love this, I want this, and if you feel it's a comfortable place for me financially to enter, then I want to go forward with that. It's the final decision of the client. And coming from an auction house, it kind of, I guess, has a level of authenticity, and there may be other ways to verify that. But during the COVID period, with you often being in Hawaii, could you work with families on uh, phone calls, Skypes, do people still do those, Zooms, images, pictures, contacts you have around the world getting resources, or do, does, do you have to see, feel, and touch it? Well, you absolutely have to see, feel, and touch it. And in COVID, I must tell you that I uh, decided not to participate in the market because we couldn't get close enough. I do know the people who own stones that are for sale. I've seen those diamonds for sale. So I do have them in, in my brain and computer as possibilities. But I felt that this was not the right time to try to pitch, to try to sell, to try to buy, even if it's a good time from a value point of view. It's not necessarily a good time from a choice point of view, as I told you. Most of the best stones are not even being offered for sale right now. They're being held back. So the opportunities and availabilities are minimal, to be, to be honest with you. As a matter of fact, most of the things that are being offered are not 
the best stones because people are looking to get some kind of liquidity with things that may be more problematic to try to sell. So um, I chose not to enter the market right now, but I've talked to many, I've consulted many people over the phone because this is a long-term kind of proposition, okay? You just don't say, I wanna buy a diamond today for a million, five million or $10 million or whatever. And then you buy the first thing or the next thing that comes along. You have to, I want all my clients to understand what they're doing too. So I have to prep them. I have to give them some kind of context for what we're doing and uh, some examples of what it relates to. And also to your um, question about photographs and information and certificates, I don't like photographs of diamonds, even though they can point you in a direction about what a diamond is. But you know, to me, I've never seen a colored diamond that wasn't Photoshopped. And doesn't and and most of them are made to look so much better than they do in real life. And so I've had so many disappointment with disappointments. Sounds with like Instagram models. So you don't. <laughs> yes, that's right. They're they're manipulated, and therefore it gives you a false sense of what something looks like. Now, if you were smart and you wanted to see that stone, and then you saw the difference, you might be really disappointed and say that. But most people. They buy from pictures too. They could if they're not sophisticated buyers. But right. I, I do not, when people offer me stones, I say, okay, you can send me the picture, but I'm going to need to see the stone too. Um, that's just a, a guide for me, but that does not tell me that that's anything extraordinary or something that I want to pursue on behalf of a client. But that's a starting point, so to speak. I don't, I, when a client asks me, for a picture of the stone. I don't want to show them a picture of the stone because I think it's either going to be too good or not good enough. So if it's not good enough, they're going to say, I want something better. And if it's too good and you show them the real stone, they're going to say, it doesn't look <laughs> as good as the picture you showed me. So that is a problem. So my, my philosophy about this is if somebody wants something really important, then we will do the due diligence. I will do the due diligence, find the stone, and say to them, okay, I have something to show you, either come to New York or I'll come to you, but you gotta see the diamond in person yourself. Right. I'm not going to give you a picture which may taint in either way your decision. So that's that my makes, business philosophy. It's a very good point. And yeah, some wise guy that I know texted me, Angelo, you said see, feel and touch. Aren't feel and touch the same thing? You know what I mean. Uh, Alan, for those that have an interest in reaching out to you, whether you have a website or whether an email that you wanted to give, how could they learn more about you? Well, I, you can email me if you have questions or if there's you know, something that I can possibly help you with at my name, alan.bronstein at gmail.com, which uh, I think you'll provide if it's necessary. And I have a website, it's true. But I made this website 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And it's not, it's not a website to sell anything. It was a website just for entertainment, just for getting people to start to feel the, the variety of colors that diamonds come in. Now, on my website, I do show extreme examples of the colors. And that's the idea. If you know how good a diamond can be, you can always work your way backwards. Sure. So this is like, we're talking about, okay, here's these are extreme diamonds. They're all sample diamonds, they're all small. They're all between a half carat, let's say, and two and a half carats. For me, that, those are sample colors for, for, uh, for a collection, so to speak. So you can't collect five carat, 10 carat, you know, unless money's no object, then you wanna do that. If that's what you wanna do, go ahead and have fun. But in terms of uh, me doing that, and my website is strictly about showing these variety of color diamonds and putting some um, verse next to it. Because if you look at the color of a diamond, it's also a metaphor for the color of something else in nature. And songs have been written about colors and, 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 uh, and uh, about uh, and poems have been written about colors. And I tried to use that color of the stone in a, in a perspective 
that romances the stone as we see it as a color, not just a diamond and not just an object. And that's and what my website's all about. Did, did you want to provide the URL for the website? Yes, it's auroragemsfoundation.com. Auroragemsfoundation.com. And by chance, right. you have a contact or email on there that people could reach out. Well, I think, yeah, I haven't really updated in a long time. And, <laughs> in in like 25 years. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you because, you know, like that wasn't, I was not trying to, through my website, um, cultivate customers. Yeah, like a clientele. Way. I just wanted to like say, here, here's a, way, a place you can learn something. Even if it's 25 years old, it's still relevant today because it's more, it's more about the aesthetics than it is about the science and it is about the rarity and it is about the value. I don't talk about how much something's worth or not because it's so a subjective. Like if I have an opinion, somebody else has a different opinion. And B, that... Um, the stones that I'm showing are unique collector's items, and it's not going to be so easy to find similar things. My purpose in doing that was just to say, here are the things that nature has made that people have not experienced or seen before. So I want to share that. I don't want to keep it all to myself, and not nobody else should know about it. I just wanted to make it something where people could, you know, get. A, their first experience from it. If they were interested, they could do more research. But you can find out anything you want to know about me on Google. I mean, my, since I haven't updated my website, let's say in 10 years or something like that, and I didn't change it even when I up, upgraded. So I have articles on there that are from, you know, 2010 or 2015. I wrote maybe 100 articles in my life. I, I, I did a a story with you, I think, for your organization, five or oh, six. Oh, that's years right. Ago. Those of you that are interested, I still have it. It's about six years old and feel free to email me. I really enjoy doing it. Uh, Alan, I am going to have to run. This has Thank been you. fantastic. I'm so glad I had a chance to see you. You look great. Uh, I hear you, you talk, your passion, cover a unique topic that was so passionate to you or is passionate to you. It was really, it's been a great pleasure. Thank Everyone, you for having me. Thank well, you thank you, Alan. Me. I'm Angelo Robles, host of the Angelo Robles podcast and founder and CEO at Family Office Association. Check us out at familyofficeassociation.com. We're active on social media, Family Office Association on Instagram, and simply Family Office, Family Office channel on YouTube. Alan, again, thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Angelo.